Hello, everybody. Welcome to the official podcast of the number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system on the web. This is the SoxProspects.com podcast. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of SoxProspects.com, coming to you for the last time from the present iteration of the Sox Prospects Mid-Atlantic offices here in our nation's capital. I am surrounded by moving boxes. I am stressed out. I am covered in dust. Joining me as always for episode number 127 of the podcast is our director of scouting, Ian Cundell. Ian, uh, can you can you come help? It seems like that'd be only fair. Uh, no. Sorry. You're a little far away. And um, I got Game of Thrones to watch later, so a little busy. But, but I mean, you, you, you could come like tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Monday, so yeah. I believe that's the beginning of the week. It so, is. What's, what's wrong with that? Anyway, oh. There are things I need to do. Well, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> I don't envy. I don't envy your situation. I'll yeah, say that. it's it's moving sucks. I hate it. It's terrible. Um, although I did find it, you saw that uh, photo of me. I, I admittedly oh, I haven't Stranger seen Stranger Things Hatfield. I haven't seen Stranger Things. Um, That's unfortunate. The the time frame I think works though because that was probably like 1988. 1989. Sure when did Stranger Things take place? Stranger Things is in the 80s. I know that, right? No, I know it is, but yeah. there's a specific year. I, I haven't seen it. I know I need to. 1983. Okay. All right. Well, I don't think you're that. At any rate, check old. check out on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash SP Chris Hatfield. Um, I found a photo of myself at some bank in the Merrimack Valley. I think that might be like Citizens Bank in Salem, New Hampshire, uh, of me getting Mike Boddicker and Dennis Lamp's autographs. Um, it's probably pretty priceless between Dennis Lamp's mustache, their sweaters, uh, and me looking like the Stranger Things kid, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And it's <laughs> funny, too, because I had no idea who either of those guys were. So, <laughs> Okay, I get not knowing Dennis Lamp. How did you not know who Mike Boddicker was? I mean, I've heard the name before, but yeah. I don't know. I, was, I mean, Let's see when he played. They traded. He's the guy they traded Schill, uh, Schilling for. He right? retired in 1993. I was three years old. <sighs> <laughs> I always forget it's a little how young before you my are. time. <laughs> God, I forget. Her. Anyway, all right. Well, moving on. Um, let's quickly get to some housekeeping first. One way you can support the podcast is to subscribe, leave us a rating and a review. We're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher, we're on Google Play Music, we're on YouTube. No excuses, people. Uh, get on there, subscribe, and leave us a rating. That'll help us get in some new ears. Uh, I also want to mention the SoxProspects.com annual drive. It is still on, and we need your help. To help keep the site free and the podcast, um, we are admittedly still a long way from our goal of $10,000, and I'm going to be completely honest and forward with you all. Uh, we're starting to lose a little bit of the momentum here, and we're a long way from the goal. So we really need your help to keep providing the level of coverage that we've been accustomed to providing and doing so for free. Um, again, we as ownership don't take any profit um, for reference, for example, our, Mike estimates our costs for 2017 are probably going to be about $20,000 between travel and, and IT costs. You can see more um, on a post. There's a post on the news page. I'm going to be putting a new one up uh, on Monday, probably kind of spelling things out a little bit more, uh, making clear the situation. But uh, just, uh, you know, we like to be able to do what we do without charging for it. There are other sites that charge uh, subscription costs. We don't. The sites that charge subscription costs are worth it. Baseball America, Baseball Prospectus, sites like that, they charge. It's worth it. Um, we like to do what we do for free. Um, so that's why we ask for help from those who can provide it again. If you can do a buck, if you can do five bucks, any amount is helpful. Uh, you know, you know, if you look at this season, for example, as it is, we're probably not going to be able to have the chance to get eyes on Salem or Greenville this year. Um, we usually do a Salem or Greenville trip. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that. And uh, I, I'm not going to be able to see them just because the schedule didn't really line up, line up for me at all to see them when they were around D.C. Uh, it looks like the only games I'm going to get to around here is going to be I'm going to get to see Portland in August, hopefully. Um, but, uh, you know, between spring training, the fall instructional league, um, and like I said, things like IT costs, hardware, software, Internet costs, hosting fees, and so forth. Um, you know, travel costs uh, for scouting and player columns. It adds up. So any support you can provide is helpful. One way you can do that is if you go to our donations page. It's SoxProspects.com slash donate.htm. That's donate.htm. 
Um, you go on there, you can uh, make a secure donation through PayPal, uh, although you don't need a PayPal account uh, to contribute. Just it, It's through PayPal, but you don't need to have a PayPal account. Um, the donations go directly to costs. We, we reimburse ourselves for travel and IT costs, but we don't take out profit distributions. Uh, we haven't done so for the last 10 years. We're <laughs> definitely not doing this to get rich. Um, the other way you can support is uh, you can support by being in the Sox prospect, being a patron on the Sox Prospects Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. You guys have heard me talk about this for a while now. We recently reset our goal on Patreon. Uh, we want to get up to $100 per episode for donations. Uh, you guys have been very supportive on there, and we appreciate that. What you do, you go on, you pledge a certain amount per episode. Which we have levels that are $1, $2, and $5 per episode. Um, you can pledge whatever you want, though. You don't have to stick to those levels. You can go above and beyond if, if you really want to. Uh, but you get rewards based on your per episode contribution. You can see what the rewards are on there. And as we do each show, we want to thank our $5 level contributors. Those are Sox Signatures, Cody Pimentel, Lendell Martin, Kirby Miller, Gerardo Iantosca, Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrall, Jeff Trainer, and David Nardone. Thank you to them and all of our contributors on Patreon. Uh, we love getting your emails. We're going to read some emails later in the show. Send in your questions to podcast at SoxProspects.com. Uh, we want to talk about what you want to hear about, so send them in. And again, as we've said the last few episodes, I think, um, don't ever feel like you know, a question's too basic or anything like that. If you've got a question about something we're talking about matter-of-factly, you might not be the only one with that, with that question. So we kind of like sometimes getting the basic ones because that gives us the opportunity to talk about, hey, what does this mean when we say this? Just because it, it makes sense to do that when people want to hear it rather than you know, having the basics episode every year or something like that. Um, so any question you have, send it in. Finally, Twitter. Check out the site's feed, at Sox Prospects. I'm at SP Chris Hatfield, as I mentioned. And Ian is at, at Ian Cundall, I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. Um, make sure you follow that. And there's actually a neat little uh, site Twitter feed if you go to our news page. That's news.soxprospects.com. Make sure you go in there to check out all the great content we've got for you guys uh, this week. Ian put up uh, a Portland scouting scratch. Uh, I think just on Michael Chavis, actually, was what that one wound up being, right, Ian? Correct. And we're going to have another one coming up in a couple days here. Uh, I think probably Monday morning on um, some other players in, in Portland. Um, Ian's seen uh, Tanner Houck, the first round pick this year recently. So maybe get something up there soon on him as well, right? Yeah, and there's uh, there was also last week we put up some video on the Sox Prospects YouTube page. Hey. And if you're not following that, make sure to check that out. Um, I think it's if you just search Sox Prospects on YouTube, you can find the page and subscribe and leave comments on the videos because that makes us feel good. Uh, we're at 575 right now, so help us reach 600. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. That would be and great. There will be Tanner Hawk video up on that next week too. So hey we're now. And in the pipeline, just waiting for next week to hey run now. it. Wonderful. Check. And uh, there was also trade analysis of the Eduardo Nunez trade, which I think we'll talk about because you said you disagreed with my take. And uh, a, and a retrospective or call up piece on Rafael Devers. So it was a busy week. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, let's start with news, Ian. Um, one or two things have happened since our last episode. Yeah, we picked a bad time to take a break for a week. Well, hey, my, I was in St. Martin, time. man. Yeah, I was about to say someone picked a bad time to go on vacation. Pretty yeah. selfish. <laughs> Dave Dombrowski doesn't wait around for anyone. He, clearly not. Okay, and um, okay, so we're recording this out of order. Uh, most of the podcast you're listening to was recorded on Sunday the 30, 30th, but uh, right now it is the night of the third, Monday the 31st, and uh, Ian and I have hopped back on to talk about the Addison Reed trade uh, and, and other things that may be out of date that we talk about later in the podcast. Um, yeah, we're not that smart recording no, on the 30th. We didn't no, really think that was That was <laughs> not, not a good idea. We could have just waited a day. <laughs> we really but, should have. Whatever. But yeah. yeah, so let's just get down to it, Ian. Uh, the Red Sox have traded for Mets relief pitcher Addison Reed for a package of three minor league relief pitchers, all of them 22 years old, coincidentally enough. Uh, that's AAA relief pitcher Jamie Callahan, who we had ranked 20th at the time of the trade, uh, and two high-A Salem relievers in Steven Nagosik and Gerson Batista, who we had ranked at 25 and 47, respectively. Uh, you wrote, and I helped a little bit with a trade analysis that went up midday today. Uh, 
Tell us about those three guys, Ian. Yeah, uh, I think that, for, well, they're all relievers, first off. I mean, I, yeah, all of them are already in the bullpen. So uh, the Red Sox, I, I do like that they didn't really delve into their starting pitching depth half with this deal. But um, starting with Callahan, he's the closest to the majors, obviously, he's already in Pawtucket, as you mentioned. He was drafted back in 2012 out of high school in South Carolina. Uh, he received a $600,000 bonus, and he's had early struggles. Uh, he was in the rotation for his first few years, but after, I think it was in 2015, he moved into the uh, bullpen full-time because he was really struggling as a starter. And uh, with that year, he had a 9.14 ERA and 2.08 whip as a starter. And then he moved to the bullpen and had a 3.06 ERA and 1.21 with. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I was yeah. looking at his, his last start. He he recorded one out and faced yeah, eight batters. Not <laughs> ideal. Um, so, so that so that was uh, so he's moved to the bullpen, and in the bullpen he, he's pretty interesting. Um, his fastball he sits from like 92, 93, 94 around there. He'll get up to ninety five, ninety six, and reportedly has touched ninety eight. Though I've never seen anything higher than ninety six. And uh, it's got late life because he gets good extension of the plate. He comes right over the top and like swings his arm and drives off his backside uh, pretty aggressively towards home plate. So it's pretty off-putting as a hitter. And I think he can miss bats with the fastball. It's a plus the better pitch. And then um, his secondary pitches, he's got a splitter, 85-87 with late dive, and a cutter at 86-88. to And both, I, I like the splitter a little bit more. Um, that will flash plus also. And the cutter's like an average of Schaufer and so he's a guy, you know, plus fastball, plus secondary, um, average third pitch, average command profile. His control is good, though. He doesn't walk a lot of guys, and he's pretty close to major league ready. So, you know, you're talking about a high floor relief arm. But he's someone that I could have seen contributing to the Red Sox maybe at some point later this year. But as with the Reed edition, I was looking at it. Their bullpen's actually pretty full right now. Yeah, now that they have Reed, they, they weren't going to have room for a guy like Yeah, they have a September. lot of guys, and they also have a lot of relievers on the 40-man who are in AAA, so yeah. Yeah. they don't really have room. They wouldn't have had room to add him until the offseason, which they would have had to do because he was Rule 5 eligible, and I think he was a lock to get added anyway. Yeah, I mean, if, with, with the Mets, he'll almost certainly be up in September. Oh, I could see him up sooner than that with the Mets yeah. if they decide, so, decide to. Um, the next guy going is the next highest-ranked by our site or by us is uh steven negosic who was the sixth round pick last year out of oregon i think it's pretty interesting actually that between him and anderson they've already dealt two of their top 10 round picks from last year's draft and it's pretty it's noticeable that that's something dabrowski seems to like to do because remember logan allen a few years ago was traded the offseason after he was drafted yeah he was the first guy traded under the uh trey turner rule yeah because now you don't have to wait a year so uh it seems like once you're in the system you know there's no you don't really uh, Dabrowski doesn't give you like a waiting period to see what you turn into. If another team values it, he'll just move you. So um, with Nagosik, he's a, he was the closer at Oregon and he's been working as exclusively as the closer this year with both Greenville and Salem. His numbers have been a little bit of a little bit of trouble when he's gotten up to Salem this year, but uh, overall he's showing he's striking guys out. But um, he's it's numbers skewed by like one really bad start where you have six runs. And yeah, seven. you pointed that out. In in the piece, and I, I noticed that when I when I was editing it, and it's it, and it's, it was a weird one because it, it was one of those where I think he gave up like one run in the first inning, and then they leave him out there, and then he stays out there, and it's like he's a one inning reliever. This isn't someone who should be working more than an inning. Yeah, because it's a max effort delivery. He's got a huge head whack. Um, it's a really quick arm. His fastball is ninety three, ninety five. Get up higher, touch higher, and then he'll show like a power slider at eighty five, eighty seven with two plane break. And it's change up that's below average. That's more of like a show me pitch. But, you know, it's not the type of delivery that is repeatable or stuff that you could hold for multiple innings. So I never I don't really like seeing him out there for more than an inning or two at most. Yeah, but just one, one quick thing, actually, and it, you have to kind of be on B ref to notice this. The reason he stayed out there is it was extra innings. Oh, so he was probably the last. He came pitcher. in in the ninth. Yeah, I mean, if, it's kind of funny if you look at his usage in in Salem. He has not. He had not entered a game. He had entered one game in the eighth uh, of his twelve. I think it looks like he had or thirteen. Yeah, games there. The rest of them he entered in the ni- either the ninth, twice in the tenth, and once in the twelfth. So he's like the last guy they're just keeping. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense then because if they had to go to a position player next, they're gonna take him to his pitch limit which is probably like 40 or something yeah that game he threw uh wow 60 pitches good oh wow that's more than i would have guessed yeah he he 
threw 40 once, and again, that that game, he pitched the 10th, 11th, and 12th. Yeah. <laughs> and so. he threw, yeah, he, other than that other outing where he threw 60, he hadn't thrown more than 30 with Salem. Yeah. It, it's kind of sense. weird because looking at just his game log on MILB, it's like, oh, wow, they were extending him out because he was one inning, one inning, one inning, a third of an inning, and then it's three innings, two innings, two and a third, two innings. But then you realize it's the 10th, 11th, and 12th, the 9th and 10th, the 9th, yeah. 10th, and taking the loss in the bottom of the 11th. And then, you know, the next time he comes out and actually throws two innings. But, you know, he had three days off. Yeah. So. And then, uh, so he's, he. I think he could move pretty quickly if performance mm-hmm. dictates it. Um, but again, I think he's like a sixth, seventh inning guy. I don't, I don't see late inning arm just because of the injury. There's injury risk and the command profile I'm not sold on. Um, and then the final guy going is Gerson Batista, who is also in Salem. Uh, he's another hard throwing righty like the first two guys we talked about. And he was signed for 250K out of the Dominican in April 2013. And he was a late signee. I think he signed it, yeah, 18. Um, oh, no, just like just turned almost 18. And, uh, but he was suspended for his first season, so he missed all of 2013 because he tested positive for a steroid. Um, he made his debut in 2014 with DSL and then came stateside in 2015 and had a really good year last year across Lowell and Greenville. I remember seeing him in Lowell, and you could tell this guy has no business being here. And so they, he got a pretty quick promotion to Greenville. And But this year with Salem, he's struggled. Um, I think, yeah, his 54 hits and 28 walks and 54 in 45 innings. So good for a 181 whip and 516 ERA. But he does he has struck out 53 guys. And uh, Batista probably has the best fastball of all the guys we talked about. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've seen him up to a, a 99. He's reportedly touched 100. He sits 94-97. And it's something that's been increasing since he signed. He used to throw in like the low 90s. He was like 90, 92, 91, 93. To, and now, you know, four years later, three years later, he's higher than that, obviously. And uh, secondaries, he, they've kind of changed over time. He used to be a change-up curveball guy, and now he's a splitter slider guy. I think it's a slider, but it still looks like a curveball. But it's like 86 to 88 miles an hour, so it's hard to call that a curveball. And then his splitter is in the low 90s, and so it's – it kind of looks like a fastball at times and both his secondaries are pretty fringy. So he's, he's a lottery ticket for me. Um, the fastball is good. The delivery is bad. The command profile is bad and the secondaries are fringy. And he's someone who had to be added to the rule five, uh, or protected this off season. So the, the I, way I, I put it with him on the, on the, I was just on the sports hub talking about this is that they weren't going to protect him, but he might've been picked. Yeah, he's someone that like the Padres take. Yeah. And they just stick him in. They did it this year. They took a guy at a low A, I want to say, like Miguel Diaz or something, who has a pretty similar profile. Like there's 100, and he has no idea where it's going. But mm-hmm. they can afford, teams that are bad can afford to keep guys like Batista on the roster. So Or the Orioles. In, they love their Rule 5 yeah, guys. <laughs> yeah. They love Red Sox Rule 5 guys. They do. So using him as a trade chip makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I mean, I. I should we just talk a little bit about the deal in general now, yeah, I guess? Yeah, I mean, well, thoughts. just real quick. on. Do you want to go first? Well, oh, yeah, yeah, just real quick on the guys, just some points I wanted to add. I mean, with Nagosik, I've mentioned this in the past, but in, in case people didn't hear that episode, it's interesting to me that he was being used as a closer, as a prospect in A-ball, because that's usually not what they do in this organization, at least. Um, they usually... But I think that's a Dombrowski thing. I wonder Sure, if- I mean, it might be, but they, it's not like they did this last year either. Um, they, you know, usually what happens is guys throw on a schedule. They, and and I mean, it's, it's the same player dev guys that have been here. And I don't think, you know, Dombrowski is necessarily going to micromanage to that degree, but maybe he, maybe he suggested it, but you know, usually we tell people like when they're like, Oh, this guy's the closer. And I say, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. (laughs) It means they're not, they don't, they're not worried about running this guy's arm into the ground usually. But I think with Nagosik, what it speaks to is the fact that they think he'll move quickly. Um, it speaks to the fact that they're prepping him for a major league bullpen role because they think he might be in one as soon as next year. Yeah, and, and that, that uh, what you were talking about with they don't care about their arm, I think is more prevalent, too, at like the lower levels. You see it in Lowell a lot and in Greenville. It's just you know kind of org arms that they just throw out there. Yeah. But this year um, with Nagosik and then even in Lowell, the guy they have closing is Juan Florentino, who... He's he's a weird he's a prospect. Guy. I mean, but he's, he's a guy kind of though. A, he's kind of interesting because yeah. um, yeah, he's like five. Yeah. He's probably like five nine, but mm-hmm. he throws ninety eight, ninety seven, ninety eight miles an hour. So, you know, we'll see. Um, but yeah, in general, what did you think of the trade? 
I mean, slight overpay based on what the market was bearing, but nothing that I'm the the, the term I've used all day is that I'm not throwing things. No, it's, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. I mean, it's again slight overpay, and you know I, the thing that I took care to say, and I did a couple radio hits from this today, and the thing that I took care to say is that in a vacuum, I think the trade's fine. Um, the problem that I continue to have with Dave Dombrowski. And maybe, you know, in, a, in an upcoming podcast, we'll get into his trade history a little bit more because I think when you actually look it's at each of the trades, he hasn't, re- he's lost one trade since he's been with the Red Sox, and that was the Thornburg trade. But, but I think the issue is that one gets magnified so much because, because Travis Shaw is exactly what this team needed this yeah. year. But, and because of the fact that Tyler Thornburg has been hurt all year. Well, but, yeah, both those things, yeah. But it's it's the fact that at this point in minor leaguer for major leaguer trades, he's moved, I think, 23 or so players for nine major leaguers. And that includes yeah. guys who aren't around anymore, like like Aaron Hill and Brad Ziegler and Addison Reed, who's going to be gone after this year. Yeah. Um, it just it starts to add up, and that's why you then need to do things. Like when you need to trade for Drew Pomerantz, you have to give up Anderson Espinosa as opposed to, say, Logan Allen and Luis Alexander Basabe. We don't know that that would have been enough, but yeah, just to throw something out there that would have you might have been more palatable in that mm-hmm. situation. You have to go up. You can't go down. Yeah. From what would have gotten and, the player, and that's I think I mentioned in the in the article. It's like they what Dabrowski likes to do is deal from quantity, except mm-hmm. when he's making those huge trades for guys like um, Sale, mm-hmm. where he's giving up you know those high end prospects. But oh. in all the other deals, it's like oh, even in the Kimbrel deal. I mean, we yeah. like we keep saying Margot and Guerra were guys we identified as players that they would trade if they were going to trade yeah. prospects. But then having to add in Aswahi and Logan Allen, yeah. right? And that's and the, and that's think, the thing, and then no one coming also, back. On Twitter, too, I think someone mentioned it today that basically the Mets just held out and then Dombrowski was just like, fine, this morning. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. And that's kind of how the trade went down was, you know, obviously the Mets had their price, uh, these three guys, and the Red Sox, I'm guessing, were holding out maybe one of them or a different name as a third piece or something. And eventually they were just like, fine, let's get it done. Right. I mean, someone suggested on the forum that, you know, it probably started at Callahan and Batista as the two two Rule 5 guys. Yeah, right. the Red I could Sox see that. Were, you know, start there, and instead of Nagosik, maybe they're on Florentino or Joan Martinez, Martinez, yeah, or a GCL arm or something. Yeah, glorious or something, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't think Glorious yeah. would have gotten them much, maybe, but you know, but again, it's you know, it's the holding out, and I mean, again, in a nutshell, no problem with these three guys. I, I really. Well, and one thing I, I do like what Dabrowski has done this year, and I mentioned on Twitter uh, a little while ago, was that the, if you came into the season and you asked me what was the area the Red Sox are deepest in, it's right-handed yeah. pitchers who are re- projected as relievers or middle a free relievers. starting pitcher. Yeah, middle relievers are – I didn't have enough characters to say that, but who project as middle relievers or for, are fringe starters. So and adding in like the Shawarans and Andersons, Andersons of the world. et cetera. Okay. And all five guys they've traded fit Darwin's that Darwin's in. Yeah. Um, so it's like well, I guess they, if you count Santos, but I don't, yeah, Santos I don't is just familiar. DSL lottery ticket. <laughs> yeah, but I just consider it because he's right-handed. I just right. put him in there. Okay. But he, they traded five guys who kind of fit that mold: three relievers in this trade. Anderson, who is he might be able to start if he does. He's like a number five, or he's you know a middle relief guy. Mm-hmm. And I I do like that because the system, it frankly, doesn't have a lot of. I mean, it, it could be partially because they don't have any hitting prospects teams want, except for the high end guys. Not high end, but high end in terms of the system. Well, yeah, because you're not going to trade Chavis for Addison Reed. Yeah, and you're not going to trade like Travis, uh, Travis, or any, even an Occamy. Like, I wouldn't have traded Occamy for him. Yeah, right. But it's he's trading prospects who are more easily replaceable now than like throwing in a Logan Allen, for example, is like a much bigger deal because that's a potential starter versus throwing in like a Gerson Batista or a Nagosik. It's like all right, you lose like another potential relief arm. And with relievers, I like the quantity approach. Like give me as many as possible who throw hard and let's see who separates himself. Mm-hmm. But the three guys they traded, they can replace, you know, that's not that big right. a deal. So right. I, I do. And I do like that. He's held on. He held on to the big chips they had, you know, he held on to groom. He held on to Chavis. He held on to Mata, he held on to Schwarin. So when, when the best, when the best player you've traded at the deadline is Sean Anderson, you can't really complain about what's going out. Exactly. You can maybe complain about what they didn't get, and, and the problem with doing that is you don't know what the cost was. But 
you know, you can't really get on Dombrowski this trade line deadline for trading too much in terms of talent. But again, that said, it's five guys out for two guys in. Yeah. Who aren't going to be here next year. And I, I do wonder if there is like a Dave Dombrowski tax where teams are just like they know they can extract at the end of the day an extra guy. So they're always going to ask for that extra guy. And if that has an impact on potential deals. Maybe. You know what I, mean? I mean, maybe. But at the same time, I don't know. I mean, maybe you want that because you think, you know, maybe you would have been there all the whole time and you – I mean, there's a way you can work that. Well, I just – it was interesting because I, I think in his – what did he do, a phone call or press conference or Presser, something? Yeah. He, he, he mentioned that they were interested in a lefty reliever, but the prices they were quoted was way too high. Mm-hmm. And looking at the lefties that moved – like Hand? Well, yeah, it could have no, been a guy we, like Hand that didn't we, Yeah, if it was Hand or Britain, obviously, that that makes sense. But like Singrani and who was the other one? Tony Watson got traded. Yep. And the return for those guys didn't seem like – anything that big so no my guess would be that it was i I didn't know that just because i had to (laughs) i basically i I, my trip home to make sure i got home in time for the sports hub was it sounded like fun yeah planes trains and automobiles but uh, i was actually running into the apartment building that i live in with my uh, the dinner i had to pick up on the way home from the uber it was it was bad um nice yeah but it's it's um i I lost my train of oh yeah no but it, it seems more likely that he was talking about um uh, one of the guys that didn't move because it, it seems like because well, Justin know. Wilson went for a pretty decent return yeah. and Br- yeah. Brad hand would have been a great fit for them. But I the reported that the Padres wanted a ton. So mm. yeah, I, I'm fine with it. I think it's, yeah. it's fair deal again in a vacuum. They helped their team. Yeah. You know, both, both moves helped their team. And I like how they're using Nunez as we discussed on the other mm-hmm. part yeah. of the podcast. Yeah. Now we'll get into things you're about to hear that we already regret yeah. saying. And then uh, the read. I like I like his impact on the rest of the bullpen. Um, I mentioned the article, but it extends it, it. It extends it exactly. So now you've got Barnes in the seventh. They really like Brandon Workman, and frankly, I mean, I, I liked what I saw. I saw I might have been the start where he kind of figured it out, or the relief appearance because I was talking with some of the guys up in Pawtucket, and they said that he was like ninety ninety two, and then all of a sudden this one outing that I was at, he started hitting ninety five. And he had been 92 for, they said, like the entire year. And then he kind of just figured it out. And now he's up in the big league level pitching in high leverage situations. But with this addition of Reed, you know, you can employ him in the fifth, sixth inning because he's a guy who can give you two innings too. So, yeah. And the thing is, if you've, the bullpen. If, when you get, uh, you know, Carson Smith apparently is close to, again, rehab maybe a rehab assignment. Uh, I'll believe it when I see it. But, you know, if Joe Kelly comes back, this could be a really Not good bullpen. Kelly. Yeah, because I mean, if you get Kelly back and you get Carson Smith back, you're looking at Kimbrell, Reed, Barnes, Kelly, Hembry, Workman. That's a pretty good, you know, right-handed well, state. and Smith, in theory. And Smith, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you, you DFA Boyer at that point. Yeah, you have not that expect him. Because... Well, and I mean, that's part of why Addison Reed is a good fit, we should probably mention, is that he's yeah. he gets lefties out, too. Um, he's, he's got a reverse lefties. split, um, in fact, so... The, the fit there is nice. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it's a good addition. It's I like it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So we like it. Uh, really quickly, things that we talk about later in the podcast that have already happened. So uh, this is like corrections, right? <laughs> except it's up front. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Raphael Devers is hitting six tonight, Ian. We're pretty smart. <laughs> I'm not to say we called it, but I'm pretty sure we said he should be hitting sixth. So. Yeah, or that he's going to be hitting sixth or, or seventh very be. soon. Yeah. And by well, very soon, we meant tomorrow. I mean, he. I think he's got three more hits today. He's got or three hits points. tonight. Yep. He's good. His third hit, I just turned the game on, like I mentioned, in, which you will hear soon. Um, I kind of just watch his at-bats, and that's it. And his third at-bat game against Zach McAllister throws like 98-99. Yeah. And he just stayed back and just slapped a single between the shortstop and the third baseman to left field. And it was just like, oh, I love it when he does things like I that. It's so beautiful. Hit. It's so nice. What was the other thing we wanted to mention? There's one more thing, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, We're running long. Come on, think. What was? Oh, Doug Fister shoving. Oh yeah, we were okay. That's a thing. That's a correction. Yeah, um, Doug Fister's not as bad as we said he was tonight. <laughs> What's he? Twelve up, twelve down. No, seven innings, seven shutout innings, three hits, two walks. So yeah, he's he's pitching well today. So oh, I'm good. sorry, Doug. Just, I'm, I'm glad we lit a fire under you to pitch well tonight. Yeah, I mean clearly it's because of us. He heard what we yeah. said, even though it wasn't. He released heard the yet. unreleased audio. Yes, he's not happy. Okay. Um, all right, everybody. Here's what we recorded yesterday. Um, thanks for listening to our nonsense.
Well, let's let's start at the top, and by at the top, I mean the top of the Sox prospects rankings because Rafael Devers has made his debut and uh, hit his second home run today. I think, right? He did. He did. Oh, field shot. Oppo. Um, pretty you, good. I, I think we, uh, yeah, we were on this one. He's he's pretty good, you guys. Um, he can hit. He can hit a little bit. Uh, well, let, let's see. Okay, so Devers finally was called up to the major leagues. Uh, over the course of the week, he was he was called up on the twenty fourth. Is it a finally though? Because they said they wanted to give him time in AAA, and then like nine days later, they called him up. Well, okay, so it was Monday so. the twenty fourth, and maybe I think this is what's worth talking about because we we've talked about Devers a lot on here. The I, I would like to point people to the news page where they can read the. We had an analysis piece on him coming up, right? Yeah. Um, very detailed. It's very detailed, and I don't want to repeat that. So, so let's let's talk about this, Ian, because this isn't isn't something we really got into there. Did they wait too long? And and I, I mean, obviously not since they called him up to AAA, because as you said, he was there for about nine days. But why was he in Portland for as long as he was to have him in AAA for nine days when they were saying, and we were saying, frankly. That this was different than Andrew Benintendi. This was different than Yoan Moncada. Although I think it's only different from Yoan Moncada in, in the timing and in the year. Because frankly, Yoan Moncada doesn't come up when he did last year if it wasn't the end of the year and there weren't any more minor league games for him to play in, if I'm being yeah. a f- frank here. Yeah, he was definitely not ready. He wasn't ready. I think they knew he wasn't ready, but it was, what the hell? Let's, who knows, right? Give it a shot. Give it a shot. This is clearly not what the hell give it a shot. This is, uh, I, I, I have a couple uh, of theories and I'll throw it to you. First of all, I think it was in part, although, okay, I had a theory and it was debunked, I think a little bit in what's been reported in that I thought that it was a bargaining move and that Dave Dombrowski didn't like the deals that were out there. And I think this is, that's a general thing that's true. It's, it's pretty clear that he doesn't like the prices that are out there for players right now, given, it's how, weird, given how slow he's been to pull the trigger. been very high. For guys that have moved, they really haven't. Um, yeah. So, who was the? What was the? The um. Who was the? The not not. The, there was a trade between Frazier and Nunez, where oh JD Martinez. Yeah, JD Martinez went for like three. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, he went for the equivalent of what? Uh, like Dewell well Lugo's, like I guess Michael Shavis, baby. If that, I think I would probably take Shavis over him. And then it's yeah. like I think it was two Latin American shortstops who were in like a ball. Right. So it was like, say, Curvin Suarez. And like, I don't know, yeah, him and Lorenzo Cedrola or something. I don't, I, it didn't seem like a lot. No, it really frankly. didn't. Frankly. It really didn't. Especially considering I think Martinez was the best bat available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The only guy who's gone for what you I kind of expected was uh, Frazier. Quintana. No, oh. Quintana. Oh, Jose Quintana, yeah. Yeah, he, but he got it's what he also because right. he's under control for three more years. Exactly. But if you look at like all what all the relievers have gone for, like Pat Neshek, um, uh, Anthony Swarzak, other than the Robertson deal, which was like the Robertson Frazier deal, relievers haven't gone for that much either. So it's a little surprising that they haven't. Right. Moved, but yeah, well, I guess we'll talk about that a little more. Well, but but anyways, I, I mean, apparently the report that I saw on Twitter was that the Giants basically had a price tag of what they wanted, and the Red Sox got Eduardo Nunez when they were like, okay, we'll pay it. Which frankly sounds more like Dave Dombrowski. <laughs> then I didn't him think sitting. it was that bad, though. I didn't either. I'm not saying I think it's bad, but I'm just saying like that sounds like a Dave Dombrowski trick. Yeah. Right? This is what it's going to take. Okay, fine. We'll pay it. Yeah. Um, but, so there was that. I think the other thing – so I, I thought he was just kind of using it for leverage. Like, okay, you don't want to meet our price, our, what we're willing to pay. We'll just call up our guy. Fine. Um, I think that's been debunked a little bit. Uh, the, the, the other question I had is just whether it was – you know, get him up there and see if he's going to fall on his face, which he's not doing, clearly. I think the fact that Devin Marrero got optioned instead of Devers kind of speaks to what they like what they've seen so far, granted, in a three-game or four-game sample at that point. Um, I think they like what they're seeing out of Devers. I think he's up. I think it's he's the guy um, for right now, and that's that's maybe why they're more comfortable going to get 
and Eduardo Nunez type who, as it turns out, can spell Dustin Pedroia. And maybe we'll, once Pedroia is a little healthier. He played shortstop yesterday, didn't he? Um, yeah, well, then that's, the, that's what I was going to say. Start, you know, spelling uh, Xander Bogarts. In the release, they said utility player Eduardo Nunez. They didn't Which say third baseman Eduardo Nunez. Yeah. Um, it, well, they it, also said he's going to start playing first base against lefties, too. Right. So, you know, maybe this is, they just said, hey, you know what? If this is what Devers is going to give us, go get Nunez to play all four positions, and maybe that says more about how they're not confident in Brock Holt. I don't know. Let me just throw to you at this point. What's what's your take on the on the Devers call up in terms of all those things, and in terms of the point we had started on before I pull this off of it? Of did they wait too long? I think they waited too long to promote him to AAA. I mm-hmm. think that if like he was promoted to AAA when we started saying he should have been at like the beginning of June, mm-hmm. then. It would have. Would you have been fine if he spent two months in AAA and then they promoted him to majors? Like that would have looked fine. I mean, I I still like, and I've, I've talked to some people in the game who agree he could have used more seasoning in the minors. But you know, it was just the way they went about it, where they were so adamant with you know he's going to stay in the minors. Mm-hmm. We're not. He's not ready. He needs time in AAA. We're definitely sending him to AAA, and then you know, ten days later, he's up. So I think that the reason they did it though was because. They looked at the lineup, and I was looking last week, and no one in the lineup had an OPS over 800 for like every day, for like a consecutive days. Even the part-time players, they just weren't getting any production from mm-hmm. almost everyone. And so it kind of seems to me that they wanted they they look at it as a lightning in the bottle type move that you know he can't be worse than what we were throwing out there. Even if Devers doesn't hit at all, he's still going to be a better. He's still going to give you more offensively than what Devin Marrero or Zuwei Lin would give you at third base, and you know, who knows? Maybe he actually just adjusts really quickly. Kind of, I mean, he seems thus far returns have been good. You know, he's using all fields, showing off a little bit of power. The defense, he made a really bad error last night that extended the game. But he's been all right at third base, um, mm-hmm. passable at least. And he doesn't look like the speed of the game is impacting him or anything. So I think they kind of, yeah, they just looking for that shot in the arm that, who was it? Was it Ellsbury a couple back in like, oh, Ellsbury would have been 07. Ellsbury got drafted in 04 or 05. But didn't he get called up in the in August and made a huge difference going forward like for the rest of the season? Um what year was the Ellsbury year? I mean, yes. I mean, that was the year that Coco Crisp was uh, that was the that was the championship year. That was 07. Yeah, it was 07. Yeah. And he, he and it came was up. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it was it was a similar situation where they were not getting a lot yeah. out of Coco Crisp. Yeah, and he came up, he played 33 games, he hit 353, 394, 509, and stole nine bases. But and, again, different situation, college player who was how old at the time, right? I mean, probably 23, but I, I know I understand that, but I think they're just, they were looking for someone who can come in and give them that shot of the arm. And yep. based on the options available, you know, they went out and got Nunez, who seems like one of the better infield bats available after Frazier was traded, mm-hmm. except he's not a power guy. And no. that's what this team is missing. They just don't have anyone who hits the ball over the fence. Right. So I think Devers is, they kind of looked it around and decided, let's give our guy a shot. He doesn't cost us anything other than service time, which is now he's obviously going to be a free agent a year earlier than if he had waited. But Well, then if he had waited, how long? I mean, so next year. Well, you not even next year. You're talking a month into next year, or right? 20, yeah, it's and 20 if, or something. And the but thing yeah. is, with, with Sandoval gone in an ideal world, Devers well, comes their tax situation too. They have, yeah. they, they pretty much have to have him as the everyday third baseman next year. He's a minimum guy and right. they need, they're going to need the guys like that. But I mean, it's, it seems thus far this it's so far so good. I don't think he'll be hitting ninth for much longer to be honest. Um, no, I think they'll probably keep it slow for a little bit, but yeah. I wouldn't hit be surprised himself. by the end of the year if he's going to be hitting sixth or seventh. Yeah. And yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's exciting though. It's, it's weird because I, I obviously I don't watch the Red Sox very often or if at all, except now I kind of find myself monitoring MLB TV and whenever he's up, I'll turn the game on. Right. So right. it's brought a little bit of excitement back for a team that's had some issues kind of, it seems, connecting with the fans and getting things going. Yeah, I, I almost pulled myself away from my family while we were on vacation to watch his debut, um, but it just wasn't really in the in the offing just yeah. with the way the vacation was structured, but yeah, yeah. it was disappointing. Um, that kind of leads in, we've been talking about it, but the Eduardo Nunez deal, let's get to that, Ian. Um, I, I don't disagree with the take as much as I did before. I, I thought 
they were getting him to be the third base guy, and it, it seems clear that's not the case now. Um, I'm not as – it seemed – well, let's start with you. It seemed like you were a little down on the trade, reading your trade analysis. Is that fair or no? I just thought it was bland. I didn't. I don't mm-hmm. think he's that good a baseball player, to be honest. Um, he I well, was just looking at just digging into the numbers and everything. He doesn't strike out, which is nice, but he doesn't walk. He doesn't make hard contact at all. He's a very. It's a BABIP average guy who's hitting like three hundred with no power. And he gets if he gets on base, he can run a little bit, but mm-hmm. at the plate. So you're looking at a contact guy, and then in the field, he's not a good defender. It turns out he's yeah. negative WAR, negative two WAR. Uh, across the positions and he's absolutely terrible at third base so i kind of looked at it that if this is a move to replace devers i don't like it really at all right it, but i think i said if he's a utility player he's an upgrade over brock holt or devin marrero in that role role and he gives them speed off the bench which is something they haven't had right so i kind of like it if it's that and if what they're going to do is use him how they have been the first week i'm fine with it you know right. he's playing he's played second short third they said he's going to get some time in first base he can play the outfield also so if they use him as a super utility guy, you know, giving guys a day off here and there, um, I, I, I'm a little, I'm all right with it. But, you know, they did give up. It was a decent price. Sean Anderson, I thought, I think has developed into one of their more intriguing wow. second tier <laughs> pitching prospects. He's right in that tier with um, guys like Darwin and Hernandez, Renil Raudes, uh, Jake Thompson, who they just signed, you know, not in the, not in well, the top. End, but. I'd, I'd call that the third tier. Honestly, and I think that that's what started maybe previewing a little bit of what the rankings are going to look like on August 1. I think that's kind of developing into a third tier where the first tier is groom. I don't know. It's it's tough to describe. Mata Hauk? Groom Mata Hauk, yeah. And then it's like, where does Schwarin and, John, where does Schwarin and Johnson fit? I think I don't that's know. almost I like kinda, tier 1 All these guys are kind of similar to me. From Schwar- not the first three, but from like Schwarren on down, I think. I guess. I guess. Uh, so, but it's just, I mean, it's, they didn't, I was, I was pleasantly surprised that the second piece was just a DSL lottery ticket. Um, yeah. Based on, based on the track record, I was assuming it was going to be someone like Darwin's and Hernandez or someone from Greenville. But for what they're getting, if they're going to use, if they use Nunez correctly, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Anderson, mm-hmm. yes, he's a good depth guy. And given how, my if I was running a team, the strategy with pitching is just get as many guys as you can and see who see who makes it. Basically, you know, it takes a little bit of depth right. away, but you can. I mean, if they can continue to develop guys like they did last year's draft, it seems like they got a few. And then this year's draft, I've I've only seen uh, I've seen Hauk a few times, and they took a lot of pitching early in this year's draft from the college level. So hopefully, some of those guys can step forward and get into that tier where Anderson was for next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was. I guess for me, it was a meh trade, in that he's not the savior, but he's all. They also didn't give up a ton. I don't know. I was fine with giving up Anderson. Honestly, there's questions about whether he's going to start. I don't know. It didn't seem like it was stuff that was going to play up in the bullpen to me. Although it's not, I can't say that I've got extensive experience seeing him pitch. I basically just saw him pitch the one time in spring training, personally, um, in person at least, to get a kind of fully developed opinion of him. Uh, I was fine with it. Um, I, you know, Nunez is a, he's a, he's average. He's he's basically I think he's a below replacement level player, isn't he? No, he's basically average. Oh, is he? Yeah, I mean, well, he's a league average hitter who is a below average fielder. So maybe, I don't know that he's below replacement level. Uh, level uh, if you're, I think he's a below up. average hitter. Let's see, his WRC is. Well, but I mean, he's. Yeah, he's actually above average offensively. He's like his war, he, his war is basically zero because he's as we said he's negative defensively and he's positive. Are you on Fangraphs? Because I'm on um, I'm on B ref. Oh, I'm on B ref too, and he's about. I mean, he's yeah, point yeah. he's a point point four this year. Yeah, so point which is basically war. average. Yeah, yeah. I so. mean, and he's fine. I mean, he's you know th- th- that's why it's called replacement level, right? It's <laughs> but yeah. it, it, you know what this allows them to do is have a lineup where you're not relying on the still probably not all the way back Brock Holt. Brock Holt let's be honest here. Yeah, he's been not good since he got called up. Um, he, you know, you're not relying on him. If Holt comes back and you've got both Holt and Nunez, great. I mean, and Nunez can be your fifth outfielder too. You know, not that he's great and left, but, you know, if you've got a game where Chris Young's DHing, you're not screwed if you've got to replace an outfielder. You yeah. Know? Um, 
kind of DH and Chris Young when you didn't have another outfielder in the lineup. I mean, yeah, okay, Brock Holt could play the outfield. But, again, you don't want to lean that much on Brock Holt right now, and leaning too much on Brock Holt has eventually bit them in the behind a number of times the past few years, even though no one really remembers it. It's just he gets worn down. Uh, so I, I was okay with it. Yeah. All right. Um, well, those are kind of the, the, the big headline moves, I think. Unless, I, I mean, if you want to talk briefly about, I guess, maybe the third sort of headline move that affects the Major League Club that people are thinking about are the, the dual injuries to David Price and Brian Johnson. Um, yeah, that was that was on the same day, basically. Yeah. Day. So Bri- basically, everyone knows about David Price at this point. Uh, elbows flaring up again. He's on the DL. I don't want to get into the st- Stupid! Nope. F- oh, I'm not getting into the stupid. No, he was can move on. Just we don't have time. Oh, uh, it's not our purview. Oh, let me. I'll just one statement. If you think he's on the DL because they were ev- avoiding put pitching him in Fenway, rethink your life choices. Um, moving on. That's a hot take, right there. It's a hot take. I'm sorry. I just have no time for that nonsense. No, no, no. The the one that they weren't pitching him at Fenway because of that. I know. I know. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's a Stephen A. Smith take, right there. Oh my god. Um. Anyway, I thought they were scratching Brian Johnson because he was going to come up. <laughs> nope. No, but he gets scratched from his Pawtucket start so because of his left shoulder uh, barking again. So now Brian Johnson, who was probably the guy to come up uh, and make a start, is out of the, the picture for that. And for some godforsaken reason, Doug Fister is starting this week. I don't understand why they don't just let Hector Velasquez pitch. How like he- I... What has he- what has Doug Fister shown you that Hector Velasquez hasn't? Am Hector I missing Velasquez something? Had one bad start. If you take his first start out, he's been fine. Like he's bailed them out at least once, if not twice. I, I don't. Right, it. Doug I just... Fister is, and it's it seems having watched a little bit of Doug Fister's here, like they both are. Velasquez has better stuff at this point. Like to he, me. Okay, I don't ahead. know. No, go ahead. No, I just, I, I just, I don't, I don't really get it either. If because, you're gonna, if yeah, you, he seems like the best option because yeah, if you take out that first start, granted it's three appearances, but it's twelve innings, thirteen innings, basically eight hits, two earned runs, eight strikeouts, two walks, one four two ERA, one eighty two opponent batting average against. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with that? Like, <laughs> and you know what? I thought, I, I thought what they would do is I'm like, okay, what they'll probably do is call up, they'll send Robbie Scott back down, call up Velasquez to be the long guy. If Fister doesn't have it, get him the hell out and put Velasquez in. Because he's done well in long relief in the majors, yeah. right? He can, we know he can do it. But he's they, dominating in Pawtucket still. But they pitched him last night, and he threw 70. I mean, I guess he only threw 74 pitches. Oh, he pitched yesterday. I didn't realize. Yeah, he pitched he yesterday. Playing. No, he, he threw five innings. He allowed five runs. It's probably his worst start of the year. Um, probably. He allowed five runs. Yeah, it's, he's, he's his first time he'd allowed more than two runs since his first start of the season. Um, yeah, I mean, he threw 74 pitches. He struck out five, walked run. He gave up eight hits. Um, I mean, it, it was at Indianapolis. I don't know what the park effects are there. But, I mean, okay. It wasn't a great start. But I thought what I thought you would do is, you know, call up Velasquez to be the long guy, right? Apparently that's not the plan either. So I don't know what they're thinking. Um, but hey, we get another Doug Fister start. Doug currently sporting a negative point nine WAR according to BRAF. This is Fister. He is, yeah, he's allowed what is it? Thirty hits and seventeen walks in twenty five innings. Good for a one point eight five five year WHIP and oh seven point four six ERA. Good for you. That's not very good. Hey. So hey, yeah, no. that was surprising. But I think the more concerning thing is that. If they have to turn to Velasquez, or not concerning, but it's kind of interesting that we could be looking at Jalen Beeks or the recently returned Justin Haley as next in line, which is something that I didn't think we'd be at that point. But no. it doesn't look like they have the, the they're interested in acquiring another starter per the comments. So I think Dombrowski said they're fine with what they have. So well, it depends on when Price is coming back, right? I mean, yeah. if Price is healthy, and this is why you put Price on the DL now, get him healthy. Right, because if you say, "Oh, we're in a playoff chase," we just we need him, and you wear him down, and you don't have him for the, for the playoffs. This team is so much worse as a playoff team. If this team makes the playoffs and has a healthy David Price, you're pushing potentially Eduardo Rodriguez to the bullpen in the playoffs. 
Well, especially because Pomerantz is pitching really well. That's what and I'm saying. Like Porcello's gotten very unlucky. I mean, he's not big well, this year. But, but he's, he's starting he's to getting, turn it around. And he's getting no run support either. So his record is kind of like deceivingly terrible. I think he has like 14 losses or something, which makes it look really bad. But he isn't pitching terribly. And yeah, if you can just get to the playoffs, if you have a healthy sale, and who knows what price he'll give you. But if you can get, you know, get sale out there for three starts in a seven-game series, you have a very good chance of winning. Yeah, I mean, okay, so. you, Porcello's last start wasn't his best start. Um, but, you know, if you've got a good Rick Porcello, if again, if your rotation goes sale price, Pomerantz, Porcello is your number four, Eduardo Rodriguez in the bullpen. I mean, maybe, maybe Pomerantz is the guy who pushes the bullpen. He becomes your eighth inning guy. I don't know. I mean... Although Matt Barnes has been very good too, you know I like Barnes as the eighth inning guy right now. Save for tonight, who's What's, that? Was he? Go figure. Yeah, um, they he, they gave up four runs in the eighth inning today. Oh, you mean? Uh, no, I'm not going to get into debates. I get in on the stupid on our forum with people who think they know stats. But check out the forum though. You yeah, forum. check out our forums. Forum. There's great debate going there. Forums at Sox Prospect. I'm actually com. serious. You should check out the forum. Yes. Um, there is a lot of good discussion. There no, it's it's discussion. going very well right now. We just added some new moderators who are wonderful um, and have Imagine somehow gotten good. have somehow gotten better since we made them moderators. Yeah. I want to be like, you could have done this beforehand, but this is great. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, I don't know. I mean, if this, again, this team with a healthy price going to the playoffs and again, hey, you know what? Before you say, oh, well, he's not good in the playoffs. Okay. Give me, give me David Price over some schmuck who's happened to have three good starts that happen to be in the playoffs, man. Um, you yeah. know, whatever. Um, this team's much different. Get him healthy. And I know yep. you got to make the playoffs first, but get him healthy for the stretch run too. But man, I wish they had another option. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's get to some of the guys mentioned. We, we, we'll do some quick hits, Ian, on some of the other kind of maybe lesser news. And I guess just because we've referenced it, um, Justin Haley's back. Yeah, that just was, unexpected. That's a fun one. <laughs> unexpected. Did not think that was coming. Um, Justin Haley, who was selected in the Rule 5 draft in December by the Minnesota Twins, was returned this past week. Uh, and he is going to be starting in Pawtucket, uh, I think, tomorrow or, or, or Tuesday. Um, yeah, I think no. Tuesday, actually. I think they're off tomorrow. Um, they are off tomorrow. So he's going to go into the rotation. He uh, Minnesota had tried him out of the bullpen in the majors, and the numbers are fine. Uh, but they then Triple A, tr- they're good. Well, they tried to stash him in Triple A, and they actually had him starting in, in the minors. Uh, yeah. So I think that they kind of realized, okay, maybe he's a little bit more valuable as, as starting depth. Uh, the Twins, who I guess while they were making a run at it, needed starting depth. Um, went and got uh, Jaime Garcia for how long was he on the team? A few weeks before they flipped him to the Yankees today. Yeah. Um, so I think they, they just kind of realized, all right. Uh, actually, I'm kind of surprised if they, if they knew they were going to flip Garcia, why they didn't just hang on to Haley. But I don't know. Anyway, it's good. It's honestly good for the Red Sox. They could <laughs> use him. They, could they definitely use him. could. I would not be surprised at all if he's in the majors at some point this year. Um, so yeah, I guess it could. Um, I mean, they need pitching depth. After Velasquez, who are you calling up if you need a Triple A arm? Who's well, starting? Probably Beeks. It's almost like bad that Jalen Beeks is your next guy because I look at Jalen Beeks and he's a guy who, before this year with his breakout, we talked about as a potential major league bullpen arm. I would have liked to see Jalen Beeks as a bullpen arm down the stretch in Boston. I concur. As as a left hander, who you know, Especially, their left handers have not been good. Either. No. Both Abad and Scott have struggled. Scott's been pretty bad of late. He got bombed again today, I'm pretty sure. And turned, turned I, back into Robbie Scott. Yeah, I mean, I think last year is the best year he's ever going to have. So, mm-hmm. um, But yeah, today... Actually, no, t- Barnes got bombed today. Scott just gave up a hit. But um, yeah, his, he's, he's struggled a little bit over his last couple outings. Um, trying to pick up his game log. You're going to be not typing. Um, yeah, he's... Uh, He's actually, you know what? He's been good for about five straight outings. He had a stretch where he gave up runs and five straight outings before that. So it was actually before we last recorded, he had a struggles. But it just seems they could use a lefty in the bullpen, definitely. But it seems like they need Beaks. They might need him in the rotation, so you can't really move him. Right, uh, you yeah. can't. I mean, you know, you've got Rowena Selias back in Pawtucket now. Uh, you know, you're pushing Edgar almost to the bullpen there. I mean, who knows who's going to come up in September, frankly. 
Uh, there's a lot of bullpen arms. They uh, already DFA'd Luis Isla, which we'll get to in a second. But uh, the the way this bullpen is going to be structured in September is going to be very interesting. When you look at the Pawtucket bullpen, arguably the, arguably their best pitcher. It's kind of actually Noah Ramirez has actually been really good as of late in Pawtucket. But I mean, he's also he's Noah Ramirez. We know what he is. But arguably the best relief option in Pawtucket is Jamie Callahan, who's not on the forty man. And are you going to DFA a guy to add him? I just, I don't know. I don't know what you do there. Um, you know, do you give a guy like almost a look as a lefty? Do you, you know, give Beeks a look as a lefty? To add Beeks, to add almost, to add Callahan, you're going to have to DFA guys. Who are you DFA? You know, has has Bryce Brents played his way into a role down the stretch? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how these guys Haley. You know who's going to be up? How they're going to make room? Are they going to make room? I, I'm I'm intrigued by how they play this. Play this, frankly. Um, I agree. You start to look at guys like Josh Rutledge, and you just say, okay, you know, is it time to send him back to Colorado? I don't know. Um. Anyway, all right. Uh, next move: uh, Edgar Jimenez to Portland and Kyle Hart to Salem as kind of a chain promotion of starting pitchers. Who at the beginning of this year, we probably could not have. Well, we'll we'll say they were off the radar. Let's go with that. Uh, Dedger Jimenez, Ian, <laughs> as we call him, Big Big Dedger. I think we talked about him last week, didn't we? We may have. Um, I think you mentioned, yeah. He got mentioned uh, in Portland. Very yeah, interesting. Good, good for him. I'm, good for uh, him. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to add to it. I, I He's still like a fringy guy, but it's pretty impressive. I mean, he's been in, with the Orcs since 2013. And uh, this year he seems to have put put it together a little bit. So eighty eight to ninety, topping out at ninety one, but from the left side. Yeah, he's up to yeah, he's like I uh, heard ninety two. Yeah. 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 So he's showing some feel for secondaries. He throws strikes. He's I mean, he's a good organizational depth arm. Yeah. So that's I, nice. I would still bet against him ever pitching for the Red Sox, but Yeah, no, but him. he's a good depth arm. So um, a, a, a guy who we don't know much about, another lefty, Kyle Hart. Um Hart was a senior draft out of uh, Indiana in 2016, drafted in the 19th round, side for a $5,000 bonus. He's in his first full season, and he's in Salem, man. Um, yeah, I mean, he's all, he was 24 in Greenville, though, so. That's true. Um, Going to need to see it. Yeah, I mean, but it's interesting. It's just, I mean, he had, he, the reason he's so old, he had Tommy John surgery his junior year, and he was a medical red shirt. So uh, he actually spent, uh, Spent five years in Indiana, so yeah. that's why he's so old. But at the same time, hey, he's in Salem before Bobby Dahlbeck or C.J. Chatham. Yeah, <laughs> would have well, lost money on that bet. Yeah, he's I somewhat. I just if people are interested, I, I've literally never seen him. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, well, I mean, well, here's why it's interesting to me is that he's starting in Salem, and there yeah. are guys. There's Logan Boyd, who was also recently promoted to Salem, who we probably didn't mention because he's kind of off the radar. Boyd had been a starter in Greenville for a year and a half. Boyd is piggybacking in Salem. Hart is starting. Daniel well, Gonzalez. Linger starting in Salem. Right, which is it? Well, I think that's just because of the timing. They they just needed a guy to make a spot start. I, my guess is Boyd will move into the rotation. Yeah. But while 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 Sean Anderson was there, Boyd was piggybacking and Hart was starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they went and got Olinger just because they needed a guy to make a spot start in Anderson's I place. I like him too. <laughs> Olinger. Not like I don't think he's ever going to be a big leaguer. He probably won't get above like double A, but just throw strikes. He has feel. Um, he's tough to hit. He was he's, apparently going to go to either medical school or veterinary school or yeah, dentistry, like, dentistry five, school or something. Five, five ten and he tops out at like eighty six. Right. I, I saw I saw him twice in Lowell, but he just gets the ball, throws it, keeps the ball down, mixes in a slider and a change or a curveball and a change for a slider and a change up. Has some feel for those and kind of just churns out and gives you innings. I mean, it's a very useful guy to have in your system. As you can see, I mean, they bumped him from Lowell. They were comfortable bumping him from Lowell to Salem. So He's a good guy to have in like Lowell that. this year. We'll put it that way. Yeah, you need guys like that around. Especially in, in short season ball. Yeah. Especially you can't have prospects filling all innings. Especially so. this year. Um, yeah. Hey, you know, good for Hart. And I mean, you've got like Daniel Gonzalez in Greenville who's had wonderful statistics for like four years now, even if the stuff is not even merely whelming, but pretty underwhelming for a guy his size. I'm kind of surprised Daniel Gonzalez is still in Greenville and Kyle Hart's in Salem. It's just, it's interesting. That's all. Um, 
What else we got? Oh, and then finally, Luis Isla. We hardly knew you. Uh, Luis Isla, who was the return for uh, Alejandro de Aza and Dave Dombrowski's first trade as a as the president of baseball operations for the Red Sox. Uh, kind of funny to think of his first trade was one that brought a prospect into the system. Uh, he topped out probably in the teens on the Sox prospects rankings. Uh, was designated for assignment as part of the Eduardo Nunez trade in order to make room for him on the 40-man roster. And he has been traded to Los Angeles of the National League for cash considerations. Uh, Ian, your postmortem on Luis Isla. He would He's show still flashes alive. Of, he'd show flashes of really good stuff. I've seen him up to 97 with some feel for secondaries. But this year, his delivery has always been bad. And command's always been a question. And this year, the stuff just regressed. He looked out of shape when I saw him. And his fastball, I, I think he was topping out more at like 93, 94. And I saw him one out, and I think he was like 89, 91. So this mm. stuff just went backwards this year, and they needed a spot. So he was the one to go. Yeah, I think at this point, other than a lot of people will scream Doug Fister after I say this, but not a lot of obvious DSA, DFAs left on the 40-man roster. Um other than Fister, really, and if you think about the fact that if Carson Smith comes back, he's going to need a spot uh, on the DL. Um, Rowena Elias is on a rehab assignment. If they have to activate him and option him, he comes off the 60-day DL. So, Although I guess Elias, because he's on the 60-day, could do two 30-day rehab assignments. They can, they can renew his rehab assignment. So I think at this point they can basically kick the can all the way down the road to sometime in September, frankly. But uh, it's it's getting a little tight on the uh, on the forty man roster. You wonder if I mean, as great as he's throwing, does Noe Ramirez maybe get in the crosshairs? I, I see like five guys I would get rid of before him. Before Noe? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, you just wonder has Henry Owens? I mean, Henry Owens gets claimed. I think that's fine. I mean, but but I'm just saying, like, if you DFA Henry Owens, you're losing him. Yeah. Um, but I mean. <laughs> If you guys DFA, like Devin, Devin Marrero, um, who's redundant now, I think with with the rise of Zue Lin, I don't think and Eduardo Nunez. You don't need both of them. Well, uh, Josh, you don't need Josh. what you, what you don't need is all of Nunez, Brock Holt, Devin Marrero, Zue Lin, and Josh Rutledge. Yeah, I think um, Steve Selsky could get you could take him off. I mean, there's there's several guys. Yeah, but I mean that said, I think I don't, I think you're maybe out of guys, especially where. You know, the, when when you see Luis Isla getting dealt, that probably means they they figured he was going to get claimed on waivers. I think they're out oh, of guys. Yeah. What I mean is they are out of guys that they will pass through waivers. I yeah, probably. Um, Maybe someone like Fister or Boyer could get through, but yeah, the young guys, I would think most of them would get claimed, or at least they'd have well, to trade the blanket. Boyer, so. I don't think can, uh, Boyer would probably not accept an outright oh, assignment because yeah. he's got seven years. Good point. So when you when you DF, if you're going to DFA Boyer, who is a serviceable middle reliever, I mean, yeah, I don't think you're going to DFA Boyer to get Jamie Callahan on the forty man. No, I agree. So it, it's it's a tighter. It's it's not like earlier in the year where there were like five guys who would probably sail through waivers if they DFA'd them. Uh, so it's it's a lot more interesting. Um, Ian, let's get to Tanner Houck really quick because you've seen Tanner Houck, uh, and then we'll get to some some listener emails but uh let's start with tanner hauk you've seen him in lowell finally made his debut uh so far in lowell in three starts he's he's on the short start program he's gone four and a third innings he has allowed four runs three of them earned on four hits and three walks in four and a third striking out five uh he's striking out 10 batters per nine he's walking six per nine so Control not there, but it's also an extremely small sample size. Mr. Kundal, tell us about Tanner Houck. Yeah, it was actually, I've had the chance to see all three of his starts, funnily enough, the way the schedule has worked. He's nice. only pitched at home. So that's kind of worked out pretty well for us. There you go. But, um, yeah, he's in the first start, he was up to 97. He seemed kind of amped up, he, uh, overthrowing <laughs> as, a little bit. As one is in their first professional exactly. start. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, he was overthrowing a little bit. He... Had some troubles with his control, as you kind of alluded to. I think he walked two guys in that outing, I want to say. But he showed a fastball uh, changeup and slider. And um, in the other two starts, he's been more 91-93. And there was actually a pretty interesting article. I want to say Fangraphs or someone did a Q&A with him. 
And he mentioned that how when he throws 91, 93, he feels like he has better control and he can get more movement on his fastball. Yeah, I think that was probably Dave Lorelei, I bet. Probably. And versus when he's up in the high 90 or mid to high 90s, it's kind of straight. And I would agree with that. Um, it was his fastball it was pretty straight when it was 95, 97. But 91, 93, these last two starts, a little bit of sink. Um, he's getting some ground balls. It's hard to square up. And he's, he's been able to control it better. His sliders flash plus, uh, like 83, 85 range. Uh, it's pretty sweepy. It's long, horizontal slider. But um, it's kind of intriguing, and it's, it's tough for righties, especially given his arm slot. You know, it's that low three-quarters, arm-heavy, a um, lot of effort in his delivery, but he seems to make it work. And the changeup seems kind of like a work in progress. It's 88 to 90, which is obviously not a lot of separation from his fastball. So, And I don't think he even threw it in the last start I saw of him, which makes sense given he's only working two inning stints. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that they focus on more in the offseason when they start to tinker with things. So it's kind of it's interesting. Um, he's someone I'm definitely going to keep my eye on. Hopefully, see a few more times this year. But I don't think we'll, we'll see the best of him until, or at least we'll get a better idea until next year. Because I, I want he's someone I need to see go deeper in the game, see how he turns the lineup over, see how he holds his velocity. So uh, we'll see. Was he a guy that you think Ian will? You know, well, let me preface the question. Uh, I know you know this, but the Red Sox, as an organizational philosophy, when they draft these guys and sign, they don't touch them as far as their mechanics or anything until the fall instructional league. Did he strike you as a guy that was going to need a lot of tweaking or no? Because we, we heard the mechanics, you know, it's the low three quarters arm slot. There's a lot of movement side to side. It seemed like in the, in the video we saw of him in Missouri. Um, what did you th- Do you think there's going to be much to do with him or do you think it's just going to be kind of like, all right, get him adjusted to working every five days and go from there and work on the stuff. I think he's, his delivery is one of those that it's going to be tough to tweak with because it's pretty unique. Mm-hmm. Um, like Kopech had, he had some weird quirks yeah, in his delivery, but he had, a, yeah. he had a pretty normal arm slot. It was just, he had the, his arm was just so much quicker than the rest of his delivery. And he had trouble keeping it all in sync. He had all and kinds of little what, tweak, little like movements and stuff. They're yeah, just like, okay, yeah. that movement, get rid of it. You don't exactly, need that Exactly, but that's easy to fix versus Hauk is where he's throwing from. He, everything he does is kind of part of it. Like he has a little weird leg kick where he, brings it up and then kicks it out a little bit and it's just i'm not sure it's it could be i'm i'm a little concerned it's one of those situations where you tinker with one thing and it throws off the entire delivery because it's so unique so they might try like change a few things maybe like where his hand position is or where he stands on the mound or something like that but i don't think he's you're not going to completely overhaul his delivery or anything like that Mm -hmm. nothing to quiet down or anything like that i I mean i just don't think you can yeah it's it's not one of those deliveries that you can kind of mess with Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, we kind of preach this too. You know, it's tough to really make much of what a guy does in his first, you know, time out of the out of the shoot as a pro. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, look at last year with Sean Anderson. I think he had about as bad a debut as a pitcher as you can. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he's been fine this year. So. Yeah, he's been fine. So, yeah. All right. Well, interesting. Um, good stuff. We'll look forward to seeing your take on him on news.soxprospects.com. Um, but just because I'm seeing this again, by the way, if, if, if you heard me chuckle about a half hour ago on the podcast, because our uh, X players page on, on SoxProspects.com or kind of the links to the player pages of players who aren't in the system anymore uh, goes, it's kind of funny. Google Chrome thinks the page is in Spanish and is offering to translate it for me because <laughs> there's that's enough. Nice that's enough. There's enough. Um, Latin American, American players, I think, is what the issue is. Um, well, Ian, let's move on then to, to emails. Does that sound good to you? Yes. All right. Our first email this week comes from Brendan Ryan. Uh, didn't he the play infielder? shortstop for the Mariners or something? And the Yankees yeah, and, and the, the Yankees Cardinals. And everyone. Bunch of teams. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening, Brendan. Um, didn't realize you were a Red Sox fan. Yeah. Well, he asks, hey, guys, longtime listener and follower. Oh, I wonder if he listened while he was playing. Um, love the work you do and start every day reading The Cup of Coffee, which is great. Thank we you. appreciate that. The Cup of Coffee is our daily recap that's on news.soxprospects.com. Um, he's got two questions. The first, you've often talked about the inability of the Red Sox to develop bench players, specifically outfielders. Is Danny Mars somebody who can fill that role? Does he have enough of a hit tool to support the speed and D to be a fourth outfielder? Um, interesting phrasing. Um, and I, that, that's the first question. We'll, we'll, we'll answer that and get, get to a second question. Um, kind of funny, Danny Marr is a guy who we've had a lot of internal debate about. 
as part of the rankings process for the, the new set of rankings that will come out on uh, probably on Monday night or Tuesday uh, on SoxProspects.com. Um, going to be a lot of shakeup, by the way, in those rankings. We've got a lot of movement. Movement I'm happy with. It's not movement for the sake of movement, but I think it's you're starting to get to the point where the sample size is getting large enough to move guys really based on what's happening. But um, getting back to the question of Danny Marzian, a guy we've talked about a lot. I think you and I and Mike kind of debated him a little bit. Um, before I get into my take, I'll throw right to you. The, the question of does he have enough of a hit tool to support the speed in D um, to be the fourth, out, fourth outfielder? Um, what is your response to that question? I would actually flip in and does he have the speed in defense to support the hit tool? Because mm-hmm. Mars is a weird, weird profile. It he's is. <laughs> pretty small. He's skinny. He's like 5'11", 6 foot, 160 pounds probably. So there's no power. And he's actually not that fast. He's like a average runner i'd say he's got really short choppy steps and i mean you see in his stolen base totals this year he's got 10 steals but he's been caught stealing nine times and the bigger issue is defensively because he can't he's not a center fielder um Mm -hmm. and he's not a right fielder really either because he has like a 30 arm so it's a left field only profile more or less with average-ish speed no power i mean that's a, that's a tough fit in a backup role. You know, you look at Chris Young, for example. He, right. He's got power. He can play all three outfield positions. Um, but so, not what he's been this year. Let's look at 2016. Yeah. Chris no, Young, but, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's just – it's a tough profile. I think he's a big leaguer at some point. But I'm just not sure how he fits with the Red Sox because if you cab him, you still need another backup outfielder who can play center field, and that's not ideal. Well, I mean, maybe not with the Red Sox because your entire well, starting that's what I, said. I, I don't right. think. Yeah. Yeah, um, so. yeah sorry. Uh, the thing to me, it's interesting, too, because I can't see them protecting him this offseason. No, I, Even, I don't either. He's had a pretty good year. I mean, the numbers are nice, um, you know, bringing him up here. Uh, for Portland this year, Mars is hitting 301 with five home runs, which is a career high, I believe. 370 Babbitt, though. Yeah, I, I just – like you mentioned, 10 steals, 9 caught stealing. Even last year, when Mars stole uh, 31 bases in Salem, he got caught 13 times. That's only a 70% or so success rate, uh, 71 maybe if you're rounding. But that the break-even point for stolen bases is about 75%, where it's worth a guy to try and steal bases. So... He's well below that this year, and he was even below that last year when he stole 31 bags. It's a weird pro. I mean, we've talked about Inuri Tavares. I mean, Mars is almost like a poor man's Inuri Tavares, I feel yeah, like. Tavares has more speed, more power, and at least can play right field, right. So, which means he can play left field also. Yeah, and I mean, so, Mars yeah. has played some center field the last couple of years as opposed to Tavares, who strangely... I mean, they're finally starting to let him play yeah, a little bit of center field out, and but... tuck it, but um, Mars... He's played some center field, but last year he was doing it in what was not a good defensive outfield in Salem that featured Mike Myers, uh, Franklin Guzman. Trent uh, Kemp. Trent, well, no, no Kemp no, wasn't in Salem. Um, yeah. who was uh, in Brian the... Hudson is who oh, that's is the was, other yeah. guy. And then once Joseph Monhe came up to Salem, Mars did not see center field very often. This year he's played 14 games, I think, at center, and most of those have come with him being flanked by Jeremy Barfield and Henry Arushia. Yeah, their outfield has taken – they've lost a lot. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has been while Yosef Monhe has been hurt. Um, Cole Sturgeon well, Cole, has been getting say, the, yeah. the lion's share of the center field reps with Monhe hurt. Um, and Cole Sturgeon, nice org guy, like him a lot as an yeah. org guy. But if you're a prospect and you can play center field, you're not seeding center field reps to Cole Sturgeon. Correct. So uh, yeah. I, he doesn't strike me as a guy that they think can play all four outfield positions. So, all four outfield positions? Or three. Fourth one? Um, when you, well, I'm used to playing softball, you see. No, I know. I'm okay. used to it. A good save right there. Thank you. Thank you. It's, you know, quick say, quick, quick goat thinking right there. Yeah. Um, all right. Brendan's second question. He asks, it looks like the 2014 draft class has a chance to be a really good draft for the Red Sox. Seems like there are a number of guys with the potential to contribute to the big league club. Um 2014 draft class, kind of an interesting draft class, Ian, uh, for those who do not remember. This is the year the Red Sox had two first-round selections that turned into Michael Chavis and Michael Kopech. Uh, Kopech, obviously, the the headliner of that class. The second-rounder was Sam Travis. And then uh, after that, you have guys like Jake Kozart, Kevin McAvoy, Josh Ockamy, Danny Mars, 
a uh, couple guys who are now gone and Reed Riley and Ben Moore. Guys who are still around, uh, Jalen Beeks, Chandler Shepard, uh, Jordan Procession, Trenton Kemp, Jeremy Rivera, uh, Jordan Betts, Tyler Hill, Devin Fisher. Um, so other guys who were in the system and, and aren't around anymore. Uh, Josh Pennington was traded. Uh, I think Pennington was tra- the only other trade guy. Yeah, Pennington and Kopech. Uh, it, it's a pretty good draft class, Ian, I think. Uh, even if it just... Even, you know, as we talked about with, or maybe it was just me with Jim Callis, I forget if you were on or not. but I was not. Yeah. Um, like we talked about, if you get one major leaguer out of a draft, that's a successful draft. Um, Michael Kopech alone and that he got helped get you Chris Sale, I think makes 2014 a successful draft. Never mind what Chavis, even with his huge breakout this year, turns into, what Sam Travis turns into. Um, do we want to go ahead and telegraph, I guess, we might as well go ahead and say it. Chavis is going to pass Sam Travis in the rankings that come out on August 1st as the number three prospect in the system. It's it's a good draft, I think. Um, I think they went yeah. ahead and no, did well. Fine. Yeah, They got some good value with late-round picks, guys like Shepard, Procession, uh, Jeremy Rivera, Tyler Hill. So, yeah, it's a pretty good draft. Yeah, I mean, even Kemp, if he can stay healthy, um, he's a guy that got over slot. Um, Jalen Beeks is a guy who got over slot at 150K. Um you know, Karsten Whitson was a good lottery ticket at 11 that didn't pan out. Um, Josh Ockamy in the fifth round is a pretty good fifth round pick, man. Yep. Um, let's get to our next question. Thanks for the email, Brendan. Uh, our next question comes from friend of the podcast, Matthew Corey of the Internet. Uh, he says, hi, guys. I saw Bryce Brents hit his 19th homer yesterday, writing this Monday, July 17th, bringing his slash line to something that's like two weeks ago. Um, he'll never be an on-base machine and at 20 years old, maybe never an MLB regular either, but do you think he can play a role on a major league roster? Specifically, I ask because the one skill that has popped for him this year, power, is the one that major, the major league club lacks. Should the Paw Sox look to get him time at first base or DH? Does one even need time at DH to prepare to DH? Seems to me he might be helpful as a backup outfielder, first baseman, pinch hitter with pop against lefties, but just curious as to your thoughts on this. Uh, best, Matt. Thanks for the question, Matt. We appreciate it. It's intriguing, Ian. I agree. He should be playing first base. Yeah. Um, but the issue is now Travis is down there, and you want Travis playing every day. You so do. You do. If Sam Travis weren't there, he's playing first base. Yeah. yeah. But it's – it's they have Chris Young, and you're not going to get rid of Chris Young. And so that's the one issue with his fit with the Red Sox is, A, you have to get him on the 40-man, and B, you have someone who does more or less the same thing already. So Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I think I like him best coming into next season as a non-roster invite who can earn his way onto the roster as the probably, fourth outfielder. He probably goes somewhere else, though. You think? I would have to think, yeah. I, I would love to see him as a non-roster invite next Oh, no, year. I agree, but I, I think he's a minor league free agent, right? Yeah, he's a minor league free agent in yeah, November. Yeah, he would have so, to be. Yeah. He would have to be signed, so I, I could see him wanting to go somewhere else where there's a clear well, path. Pretty maybe, sure Young's under contract next year. If I'm the Red Sox, I'm trying to sign into a deal with an opt-out um, and, and bring him in Young, as an NRI. Uh, Oh, no, Young's, Young's a free, a free agent. agent. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, so bring, yeah. say, Brents, look, you can come in and compete to, for the fourth outfield spot. We're also going to give you a first baseman's glove. But the issue is with him, again, which actually with the Red Sox, as you alluded to, is kind of minimized a bit because you're playing three center fielders already. But he can't play center as a backup outfielder. But but that's yeah. why I think he fits. Um, I yeah. would love to see him maybe get some time at DH, too. His, his line right now is 272, 346, 525 with 21 bombs. Um, yeah, he's hitting really well. So. I'd love to see him as a September call-up. I don't know if they can do it. I agree. Without, without cutting Chris Young. It, it just doesn't make sense otherwise. Yep. Um, our final email is from – actually, you know what? I mean, we already talked about it, but Michael Burns says I was important and recently and caught the double-A debut of Dedgar Jimenez. He went five innings. It was wild, five walks and an HPP. But he allowed only one ball out of the infield, a ground ball single. Uh, during his first four innings in the fifth, he gave up three warning track fly balls, a double and two. They were caught on the wall. On the downside, he seems to have a Sandoval-esque build. What do you guys think of him? Possible bullpen <laughs> arm. Um, we've talked about what we think of him. I, I don't see him as a bullpen arm. I don't see him as a bullpen no, arm. No, it's Stuff's not good enough. Or guy. Um, yeah, solid or starter depth. I mean, maybe if if you move to a bullpen, you like change his arm slot or something because he's a lefty. But I think that what he, just, he is is nah. good. He can eat innings, no pun intended. Nah. You know, he gives you quality minor league innings. So Should I say the line? Very slow guy. Yeah. Should I say the line that my scout friend told me? On you him? did. You, I think you said the last podcast you told that did story. I? Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Well, thank you for the email. And again, it's podcast at socksprospects dot com. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, the download. We appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Um, Firefly the cat is coming up to say hello. 
So I think that means it's time for us to go. So for Ian, I'm Chris. Again, let me just say one more time, uh, SoxProspects.com annual drive is on. We would appreciate your support. If you want, go to the news page. There's a post there. Um, I'll be putting one up on Monday, but there's one from Friday as well. You can either donate on Patreon.com slash SoxProspects or go to SoxProspects.com slash Donate.htm uh, to, to make a straight-up monetary donation as opposed to supporting the podcast on a per-episode basis. We really need your support, guys. So if you've been thinking about supporting, haven't quite gotten there yet, donations of any size are appreciated, and we could really use them. Um, the budget's a little tight right now, and the momentum on the annual drive is a little slow compared to past years. So it's a great time to hop in if you've thought about giving in the past and really haven't. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you listening and reading, following on Twitter, and all of the like. Ian, time for us to go, man. See ya. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back in your eardrums, not next week, but the week after. Uh, maybe I'll have some tales to tell from seeing Portland over in Bowie. So thanks for listening, everyone.